morning, everybody. So I'm David Barber. I'm the director of the UCL AI Center. And I'm um, very happy to welcome you all today to, I think, what's going to be a very interesting event. Um, I just want to say a few words of uh, a welcome and introduction. So first of all, I think all of us are in agreement that AI is a, is a big deal, uh, both in terms of science and society. But I think one of the you know, interesting things that uh, certainly we as CDTs, uh, since sort of training, have been interested in is the economic impact of this uh, uh, AI field as well. So when we particularly uh, at the UCL Foundational AI CDT uh, thought about this, we were thinking about you know, the UK economy and what, uh, what we've done uh, well in the past. And it's quite striking, actually, the successes we've had in terms of uh, entrepreneurship, particularly in the AI area. So, you know, we've really been uh, punching above our weight in that sense over the last uh, decade or so. And there have been a number of, you know, uh, very successful companies started. And actually, this is really, really exciting. So we thought, well, you know, maybe it's a, a good opportunity to help uh, students who wish to, to get some entrepreneurship training and then to you know launch their uh, sort of, uh, companies towards the latter stage of their PhD. So in that sense, our particular CDT and I think others as well may have uh, conceptually, if you like, two exit routes. There's the standard exit route, which is a, to become a researcher in industry or academia. Uh, but the other exit route would be to be an entrepreneur, uh, to make your own sort of a company as sort of a deep tech entrepreneur. So uh, that's uh, a lot of what today is going to be about, to sort of you know, discuss how to do that, uh, what the options are, uh, what you need to think about, um, and also to talk to people who've been there and, and done that, and you know, how to get connected, networks, mentorship, et cetera. Um, I should also say that I think you know, one of the uh, really important things about uh, you know, thinking about what to do is that we, we need to also make sure that we finish the PhD. So this is a kind of an interesting uh, balancing act. You know, so on the one hand, you've got your, your studies ongoing, uh, but you've also got you know, somehow this idea is maybe of uh, making a startup company. Uh, of course, we're focused on uh, the prime goal, which is to finish your PhD. But after that, then you know, we need to think, uh, maybe if you're interested in how to make a startup company. So one of the interesting things also about today is that networks are really, really important. It's hard to do a startup company on your own. And uh, most companies are going to do that in collaboration with a number of other, other people, uh, possibly other students. So um, today, I think, is an opportunity also to find other people. So uh, those of you who are perhaps in a, you know, a smaller place or working only with a small number of uh, fellow students, Today's interesting chance to, to try to find out who else is out there uh, to you know, broaden your network and potentially even to, to join up uh, with those people to think about you know, how to you combine your skills and interests and talents to actually then make a, a much more formidable unit. Um, I should say as well, I think what's personally very interesting about the AI area and potentially others as well is I think that the, the concept of really you know, what, what business is about is, is maybe changing somewhat. So uh, I, I may be wrong in this because I'm not a business person, but my, my perspective uh, you know, from a few years ago was that you know, there are different kinds of people. Like, you know, there's business people um, who think in certain ways and there are sort of you know, science people who are thinking in completely different ways and these worlds are really not very well connected. And, um, you know, maybe that business world is a little bit, uh, well, not so interested in the technicalities and the details and they don't really matter. And, uh, but it's about, you know, your drive and your sort of, you know, success, uh, sort of, uh, you know, drive and you know, willingness to succeed and all this kind of stuff. But I think what's very refreshing, very exciting and interesting about the stage we're in now is that, you know, you can, as a, as a science person, really make a, an amazing contribution uh, in, in terms of entrepreneurship. And these skills are absolutely critical. They're really vital to actually uh, do very well in this area. So I think this sort of you know, classical dichotomy between the business world, if you like, and the world of science is, is being uh, weakened uh, significantly. I think this is a great chance for you know, people to really to make a, a big improvement. So I personally would love to think, and I'm sure other you know, CDT directors 
uh, around the UK would be very happy to think that you know we've done our bit and uh, students um, have gone on and you know created economic and social value for the people uh, on completion of their, of their PhD. Okay, so um, maybe I should tell you a little bit about uh, UCL um, and uh, the way that, that we think about this, and I'm sure that others will uh, be able to tell you more later. So at UCL, we actually have uh, founded uh, several companies. So we've founded companies you know, on a range of areas in entrepreneurship, many, if not the vast majority of them, actually uh, with student input. So typically uh, what's happened is that uh, an academic uh, together with their students come up with an idea that they think is interesting from uh, their research that may have commercial value and then there's a process in which they go around and they try to understand whether or not there's really uh, a market for this idea and then typically they get small amounts of seed funding which can then uh, help them to um, sort of establish whether or not that idea is actually likely to to be useful in a, in a business sense. Uh, once they've gone uh, through that stage, then some of them, but not all of them, will go on to get uh, other forms of funding, maybe some startup funding uh, here and there from um, usually uh, venture capitalists, although it's not necessary to, to go down that route, but that's uh, one of the uh, relatively straightforward ways to, 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 to get some initial funding. Um, but of course, you know, there are, uh, the story is very complicated after that. You know, you of course do need to make sure that whatever you do does have uh, commercial value. Uh, things don't work unless they ultimately, uh, you know, actually uh, you're selling products or, uh, you know, people are actually interested in what you're doing. Um, so I personally have been involved uh, in a few companies uh, from UCL and continue to be interested to support students and others to, to make companies. Um, and in my experience so far, uh, what's uh, incredibly important is the, the team. So the, the people that are making up the team is like probably the most important factor. Uh, you know, it's incredibly important to feel that the people that are in your team are reliable and that you also have fun with them because this uh, startup uh, journey is very uh, bumpy, it's very complicated. Um, and there's a lot of uh, effort that, that people put into it. So you need to feel very confident and comfortable that your fellow uh, people that are taking, you know, going on this journey with are really, you know, uh, there for the right reason. So that you feel that you can you can trust trust each other and feel uh, confident in each other's capabilities uh, to go forward. And I think that's really 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 important that you know, right from the start that you you have a healthy uh, respect for. Uh, hopefully the diverse set of skills that each of you bring to, to the team. Um, and I think once you've got that, you're in a, you know, a very strong and powerful position to actually make a great team to go forward and, and solve uh, the challenges that will inevitably come, come your way from maybe not getting the funding you need or uh, having to pivot your ideas or you know, to talk uh, and maybe you know, drastically uh, change your, your thinking potentially uh, in light of your uh, you know, the, the feedback you may be getting from potential clients, etc. So um, that's all to come today. Uh, there'll be lots and lots of discussion about that. Um, but I'm going to get wrap up uh, now for this intro and give you guys a, you know, a few minutes to uh, to have uh, you know settle down before we start. I think uh, officially at ten. Um, please, if there's any of you who've got any questions about uh, you know, particularly UCL. Uh, the CDT or what we are doing in terms of entrepreneurship, uh, please do email us at the AS Center at UCL, um, myself, David Barber, um, and you know, ask questions freely. Um, there will also be an opportunity throughout the day to ask questions as well. So please do uh, contribute, engage uh, with ourselves and other uh, participants uh, in today's uh, talks. So. With that, um, I'm going to wish you a good morning and uh, we'll see you at 10. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. I saw that Sharon is telling me to start already, so I'm going to do so. Um, I hope you can all hear and see me properly. Yes. So. Um, yeah, please feel free to type in the Q&A 
uh, if anything is unclear, etc. Right, so nice to see everyone. My name is Riam Kanso, and I'm the CEO of Conception X, which is a program that's designed to um, help PhD students launch deep tech startups whilst you're still studying uh, at the university. So um, we have an hour. So the format is going to be the following. I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about myself at first, very quickly. And then I have a talk in two parts. The first is about entrepreneurship and you know, um, startups in general. And then we can have a Q&A session at the end of it. And then I'll go into a little bit more about the Conception X program, how you can apply, and uh, we'll do questions and answers afterwards. Uh, of course, I want it to be um, a collaborative session, so you will have to use the Q&A. Uh, I don't see any of you, so you might be, I don't know, in your bedroom still with a coffee, um, or if you're in a more stereotypical definition of uh, what people think an entrepreneur is, you would have, I don't know, run 20K and had a bulletproof coffee and meditated and journaled then are probably, I don't know, microdosing something while furiously tweeting about it. But I think we will see that all of these things are um, stereotypes as well. So um, about myself, uh, I myself did a PhD, but a long time ago, uh, went to Oxford, did a PhD in neuroscience, and whilst doing my PhD, I realized that academia was probably not for me. So then I moved on and worked in computational science at UCL, uh, started a consultancy there, and then kind of spent seven years cycling between doing more kind of academic industry jobs, but also starting companies. I started Crowd Helix, which is a platform that kind of optimizes teams that apply for grant funding, uh, and also uh, Conception X, which is my most recent venture. And now we're a team of seven people and nine coaches, and I'll be telling you a little bit more about that. But I think, from my experience, just kind of noticing the highs and lows of entrepreneurship and starting a company whilst also having an academic background um, has made working with the many PhDs that has done our program, uh, that have went through our program, um, quite interesting in terms of the similarities uh, that we've all um, gone through as well. So this is a brief uh, intro, very happy to you know, talk to you all at the end, but I do have some slides, which I will start sharing imminently. So one second. All right. Cool. And okay. I'm going to pop the Q and A. I, I guess everybody can see my screen. I'm going to pop the, uh, the Q and A box here so that. Uh, I can see if anyone has any questions. Right, so I think I will start with a quote from Naval Ravikant, who is a writer and a thinker. And the quote is, the information age, which is what we're now in, um, is going to reverse the trends of the industrial age, where everybody went and worked in large companies, factories, etc. We will go back to working for ourselves. And I think this is a trend that a lot of you might see already. Um, lots of people are going into entrepreneurship, starting companies, freelancing, becoming YouTubers, influencers, etc. Um, Dave Chapman, who's a professor uh, at UCL, has a favorite quote, which is that in the 70s and 80s, if you ask people what they dreamt of being, they would say, you know, rock stars, but now everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. And I think there was a stat recently that most people want to be, like young people aged 18 or so, want to be YouTubers, which is something interesting because even a YouTuber is an entrepreneur where the product is basically yourself and your time. So there is an increasing trend towards moving more away from the kind of institutional nine to five job to something more flexible and there are levels of flexibility 
which I think we will get into as well. So moving on, um, just to cover some basics, because I think a lot of you, sorry, there's something. A lot of you know this stuff already, but just in case you don't. So a startup is a young business. You can incorporate a company on company's house in the UK in 10 minutes with 30 pounds. Uh, so it's nothing difficult to do. An entrepreneur is a person who starts a business. So that's relatively straightforward. Equity is ownership in the company. So when you start a company on your own, presumably you own 100% of it. If you start it with other people, it's kind of split between you. Once you start it, if you don't have anything, that equity is worth nothing. But if the company grows and you know, becomes more valuable, uh, that equity becomes worth something much more. And a venture capitalist or a VC is an individual or a company that invests in a company in exchange for equity. So, you know, putting in 10K in exchange for 2% uh, of the company or 5% of the company, et cetera. Uh, equity is a very interesting topic and, you know, whether companies should take investment early versus not. And these are all things that we can discuss uh, at the end as well. Right. But I think in terms of what entrepreneurship is and the motivations that people give to start a company, people have different views about that. Like when you ask people, why are you starting your own company? Some people say, I want to change the world. I want to solve a problem. Uh, you know, I want to become rich. Well, you will get rich only if you're really, really lucky because only a very small percentage of startups make it. But I think there is a very fundamental thing here and it's about agency over your career. Um, it's not easy, but I think if we look at the lifetime that we have ahead and how you choose to spend the, you know, 12 or so more hours that you're awake and what you do with it, there is a certain, the people differ. There are some people who are more in favor of a flexible and free life where they get to choose um, what they do with their time and how they partition it. And of course, with that freedom comes a lot of responsibility. Uh, and other people prefer a more structured route where someone else assumes the responsibility and they have specific tasks to do. And there is both are viable ways of living. Entrepreneurship offers you infinite choices that wouldn't be available otherwise. However, it's true that only a very small percentage of people go down this route. Why? Chances of success are not that high. It's quite risky. It's not necessarily compatible with other life choices you want to make. And let me put it this way, the highs are highs, but the lows are quite low. And I guess here in this um, session, we have a lot of your PhD students who are potentially interested in entrepreneurship. So one of the things we'll do in this talk is um, just cover a few of the questions or misconceptions about what it means to go down this route as well. And I think I'm just going to touch on something here. Um, entrepreneur versus PhD researcher. I think when people you know, ask what a stereotypical definition of entrepreneur is, you might have a lot of ideas, you know, Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, or you know, if you watch Silicon Valley, the kind of mountain climbing, change the world type individual. But I think, our, what we push at Conception X and what I personally believe as well is that there are more similarities between an entrepreneur and a PhD researcher than between an entrepreneur and a classical business person or a consultant or you know, someone who works in a company. And why? A PhD researcher has a certain amount of time to solve uh, a problem, to work on it, to iterate. They're identified by curiosity, attention to detail, deep interest in a subject and an entrepreneur is the same. I mean, an entrepreneur is iteratively looking for uh, a business model the same way you would test an experiment. Uh, also equally obsessed by an idea or a domain of interest and you know, has some time to think about it. And I think what, we're, what, what, what we think as well in, in Conception X, which, I, which I'll get to is that what in your three years or four doing a PhD at UCL or all of the other institutions that you might be part of, isn't this a good time to start experimenting with, you know, working on a company, commercializing your research, possibly building a startup, 
I mean, you have uh, your you know, co-working space, which is your lab. You have your peers around you. You have access to equipment. You have access to intelligent people and supervisors like Professor David Barber and others who have started companies. So why not use this time to experiment and see how the two can actually be related to each other? Going back to what a startup is, this is the kind of classical definition. Young companies that are founded to develop a unique product on the surface and make it attractive and irreplaceable for customers. And I think we all have products that we use every day. Like I use you know, Spotify, for example. Some people use Deliveroo every day. All of these are startups that's covered a market need at some point, and now they're not startups anymore. Usually startups are rooted in innovation and they're addressing the deficiencies of existing products or creating entirely new categories of goods or services, etc. But my preferred definition of a startup is this. So that's the official one. But I think startups are more like a science experiment, but for commerce. Because what you're testing is, is this product in this, in this market viable or not? And to do it, you just need to test and iterate. And I think this is where we come to the importance of tech, because we are focusing on tech startups here, and all of you are working in deep tech, which I'll get into. Given that the startup is trying to find a repeatable and scalable business model, which are two words you're going to hear a lot, um, it does also mean that you're against companies that have been doing this for ages, who have like a thousand employees around the world. So it takes too much energy for a young startup to actually compete with, I don't know, Shell or, you know, uh, GlaxoSmithKline or, you know, huge companies. This is why most successful startups tend to operate in uh, either in very new markets or are working on very new technology that kind of disrupts what's existing out there. And all of you fall under that category. So you're in a really good place. And I think this is one of the common misconceptions. And I think David alluded to it at his intro as well. It's this idea that to become an entrepreneur or to have a startup, you somehow need to become a business person and do the business training and you know markets and analysis and all of that. That's actually not true because there are people who can do the market analysis bits that you don't want to do or the business development or speaking to customers. That's why a team is important. To become a founder and an entrepreneur, what you need is to adopt a creative mindset that allows you to think about how you can bring your research to market. You need to find team members and allies for things that you cannot do yourself. I think this is a big problem with PhD students because I think there is this idea of the star PhD student who can do everything, like you know, you know how to do research, you can write code, you can do customer analysis, etc. But I think in a startup, it's really important to find a team because you need to be focusing on the thing you love doing most and then work with others who will do the things you don't like. Um, one of the things we do in Conception X is like sometimes the CEO of a company is a scientist, it's not a business person, and they find co-founders or a chairperson who will do the bits that they don't know how to do because they've been doing it for 10 years. So there's no point in you learning something over one year if you can join forces with other people. And the other thing, so these are like the top three things. The other thing that PhD students need to do is um, to let go of the perfectionist mindset because once you're trying to build something, a product or a service, it doesn't need to be perfect or what you think is perfect before showing it to anyone. On the contrary, like you need to show people what you have so that you can get feedback quite early. And this is one of the hardest thing because a product launching on the market is not a paper sent for publication where you need to be very happy with how it is. So the idea of kind of letting go of, you know, the, I need to show it when I feel good about it and then show it to people to use it before is something that we work a lot on with the students that we have on the program. Um, so in that sense, kind of to deviate from the stereotypes that come with the word entrepreneur and business, etc. we actually use the term venture scientist in Conception X. So venture scientist is a science or engineer who is trying to become a founder and launch a startup. 
Um, and it's a term that's been resonating with uh, the students that we've worked with so far. And I think, you know, these are some kind of tacky slides, but I think it's important to say that in the startup world, people think that it's a relatively, you know, you know, you build a thing, you get investment, then you build a team and more stuff. But I think this is quite a famous graph, uh, uh, no, wait a second, of how things actually are like. Uh, so you have the launch hype and then uh, the humps of iteration. The first time you realize you don't have a clue, the plateau of disenchantment and the sloth of ascent. So it's relatively nerve wracking to get where you want to do and it's not a straightforward thing, but uh, finding allies around the, uh, along the way is really helpful to, to get there. So I guess what I'm trying to say, entrepreneurship is not easy. It's not strictly a meritocracy, right? Because there are inherent systemic flaws in the ecosystem, i.e. how investment is raised, uh, capital, which means money is a barrier, but I think having the right mentors around you is a much bigger barrier. And there's this huge debate about whether entrepreneurship can be taught or it's something that you know, people have naturally. And the reality is that you can learn a lot of it. Um, it requires discipline. And I think having the right community and environment around you uh, would be a great factor in doing that. And this is why people think that you know companies you know getting an IPO, which is you know going out on the market or you know making a huge success, is something that happens overnight. But usually it takes ten years. Um, there is a great example of a company called Satalia that got founded in UCL by Daniel Hume, and I think Professor Barber was probably involved in that as well. And it was launched, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, and it's um, it recently got acquired by WWP. But it's not, you know, it's like, oh, you know, acquisition, great overnight success. No, it took a lot of years to get there. And most of the successes that you see that look like a surprise usually have a long background behind them as well. Um, this wouldn't be about entrepreneurship if we don't have a mandatory Steve Jobs code, but I really like this one because I think it resonates with a lot of people and I'm going to read it. So when you grow up, you tend to, you get told that the world is the way it is and you just need to live your life inside it and try not to bash into the walls too much, try to have a nice family, have fun, save a little money, but that can be a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact that everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were not smarter than you and speaking specifically to the PhDs on this call. So you can change it, you can influence it, and you can build your own things that other people can use. And once you learn that, you can never go back again. And I think this is a great quote. Um, I'm not going to go too much more into entrepreneurship in general, because I do want to tell you about the program and there's some detail related to that. But if anyone has any questions, you can type them into the Q&A now or any discussion points and we can take a few minutes. And if there are none, I can go straight into what the program is about. I'm just going to give it a second. It might just be easier to do all of the questions at the end, I guess. All right. So let me start talking to you about Conception X, which you can all apply for. Um, one second. So what Conception X is, we're a program and a platform that creates investable deep tech startups from leading research labs and PhD programs. So we help you launch companies. Uh, what is deep tech? Just in case uh, someone knows. So it's a technology innovation that relies on original research or meaningful scientific discovery. By default, all of you are working in deep tech. So there's no question about that. Um, Conception, Conception X initially launched in 2018 with UCL. And since we've done that, Conception X is now an independent, not for profit, and we work with PhD students from across the UK. So, this recent batch of PhD students, we have 25 universities represented. So, the program is nine months long, but it's designed to sit alongside your research. So, you don't need to take time off from your PhD. Um, it's, um, it's designed to have training sessions interspersed throughout the weeks with like a 
bit more consistency in the first four months and then going on to more one-to-one -one support. And it's specifically designed for PhDs, as I said, who are looking to commercialize their research and launch a company. Um, sorry, one second. Uh, so, uh, projects span many focus areas, so AI is a big one, but we also work with crypto, big data, microcircuits, in vivo cell models, internet of things, machine learning, quantum computing, um, and, you know, re virtual augmented re reality and data science and uh, robots and everything else. Uh, sorry, I've just seen a question in the chat. Right, so the question is about how to find mentors and advisors and how to get them on board since they don't have the money. Yes, I'm going to get into this. If it's okay, um, I'm just going to cover this at the end. Um, so far at Conception X, we've supported 165 teams of PhDs. This is a picture of when we used to do things in person. These little companies have raised more than 15 million pounds between VC funding and, uh, and uh, uh, grant funding like Innovate UK. And the thing is, even those who didn't start companies, so you're not forced to start a company in Conception X, even those, um, even those who didn't start companies ended up either working with some of our partners or um, ended up even those who don't work with corporate partners, you go back to the lab, but then you have more skills to talk about your research in a more commercial way. And then that makes people more eligible for things like innovation, grant funding, et cetera. Um, this is an example, which I like to give. So RACO were joined Conception X in the first cohort in 2018 um, as three PhD students who are working on a quantum machine learning product. Uh, they joined Conception X because they had an idea. So you don't need to have like a very clear idea of what your business is about, but they knew that they had potential avenues to start to start up with the research that they knew. So with in Conception X, we paired them up with Ian, who is the person in the middle, um, who became their kind of business co-founder. And then they raised 1.3 million pounds from uh, a UK VC called Balderton. Then they entered into partnership agreements with Microsoft and NVIDIA, and they became a partner of the Amazon Quantum Solutions and then signed with Merck. They're now named one of the hottest, uh, the hottest European quantum companies to look out for. And I think the reason I gave this example is that they were still in their PhD when they joined us and they came to Conception X and got all of the support in terms of being mentored to speak about the research, being taught how to pitch for money, but also like the team building aspect. I think finding the right chairperson and co-founder, et cetera, that can join your company early on um, is very important because the right person can help you shortcut 10 years of bad decisions, especially if they know the industry or they're experts in the pharmaceutical industry, et cetera. So this goes a little bit to one of the questions. When a company is starting out, they cannot find the right advisors or mentors, but uh, uh, they cannot find money to pay the right advisors or mentors or co-founders. But if the company is working on a really interesting proposition, you will find that some people are willing to join your team in exchange for equity and not money. So this means that they expect that the company will become very valuable later on, and it's worth much more than you, you know, scraping some money to buy them. And this is why it's a very important decision and there's nothing scientific about it, about how you get the right team members, how much equity you give them. In Conception X, usually if two PhD students join forces to form a company, like we've had uh, two students uh, join forces to build an ingestible capsule for gut microbiome monitoring. And one of them was a mechanical engineer and the other one was a cybersecurity PhD. And there was a little bit of you know, discussion at first, like who has done more research and who should have more equity in the company. Usually when things are really early, we just advise people if they like each other to go in at 50-50 and then you know, negotiate afterwards. If you have like someone senior who you want involved, 
usually they'll come on as an advisor and then you know for free because people have time for really exciting companies everybody wants to be part of this deep tech is the future so you'll find that people are coming in to do pro bono support for free if the relationship becomes better you can start negotiating either giving them a board seat or a little bit of equity but we at conception x can give you advice about how to do that properly because we're a not-for-profit and we don't take equity uh, so uh, we have uh, lots of templates and case studies to kind of show you what the right thing might be for you um, more recent examples because you know uh, Rocco were quite early three years ago but now these are companies that are now in this cohort so they're not that much older or more advanced than you are Titan, which you can see on our website, um, um, are a team of PhDs from UCL working on AI and quantum as well. And they're working on use cases in satellite images, wearables, and agri-tech. What they like is to detect um, emergencies such as floods or tornadoes early on. You will see that uh, one of the logos at the bottom of my slides is Deloitte. So a lot of our PhD venture scientists work with our partners, Deloitte and Barclays, to find specific use cases or get access to data. And that's a huge benefit of the program as well. Another company which you can see on our um, program uh, on, on our website is Third Eye Intelligence, and they're using AI again to solve problems in healthcare. When people join Conception X, many times they don't necessarily know the application area of what they're doing because sometimes they're just working on an interesting piece of tech. So you don't necessarily know if this is going to be a healthcare um, application or if it's going to be something that's more, uh, I don't know, uh, health or climate or all of the other sectors. And I think one of the points of doing Conception X is meeting the right mentors and advisors and uh, coaches who will help direct where your tech should be used. And this is a huge benefit of the program. Like when Rocco joined us, now they're working in quantum drug discovery, but because this is why the teams, this is who they met in terms of mentors, and this is what they were advised to do. But their tech was sector agnostic, so they could have you know, worked on batteries, for example. It doesn't really matter. Um, moving on. So the program is nine months long, and because of COVID, we've had to do it all online, so the program is now mostly virtual. Uh, the Conception X team is going to be moving. Uh, we were based in Idea London, which is a UCL related space, but from end of October onwards, we're going to be moving in a, I don't know how we pulled it off, but a very swanky building called 22 Bishopsgate, and it has state-of-the-art rooms and conferences and filming studios. So I think we're going to be, I mean, pending what happens with COVID, We'll be moving to a hybrid model where some of the lectures will be um, and, and the training will be in person, but then you have the option to join virtually, and especially for the students who are not based in London as well. What does the program actually consist of? I'm going to say before I do this slide is that we have two tracks on the program, Project X and Startup X. Project X is the first phase, so this is if you have an idea and you want to become upskilled in entrepreneurship, but you're not necessarily there and having an idea of what your company will be like or a prototype. So you join and then it focuses a bit more on, on training and just kind of general entrepreneurship. Once we've identified that a team has potential or a prototype, which is kind of an early version of your product, we upgrade them to the startup X track and then they get assigned one business coach and one technology coach. These are very experienced individuals who have worked in the same area that you would be working on. So if you're, a, I don't know, like a quantum AI researcher, we would find a quantum coach. And if you're working in healthcare or in um, energy, we'll find you a coach who has experience in that industry. Then over the course of the program, those coaches will see you every month. They'll give you tasks for the next month. You establish a really good relationship with them. And we track your progress until you, know, you get to where you need to go and where you're possible to raise investment. These coaches are the most essential and important part of the Conception X success so far, 
because it's really hard to, you know, train 60 people about what a product roadmap looks like if everybody's working on very different products. But we've bypassed that by doing the one-to-one -one support. These coaches are individuals that we pay and they're not allowed to have like more of a commercial interest in their company. So their goal is specifically to get you from point A to point B and to advise you and connect you to the right people. This is the main difference between uh, sometimes people join immediately on the startup X track if they're already advanced enough or if they have a prototype. But these are the elements of the program. The first is deep tech entrepreneurial training. So we've designed the training program specifically for PhD students who are engineers and scientists and who want to um, learn about entrepreneurship. This is uh, nine kind of full day sessions, but they're interspersed in half day chunks over the first four months, which you can join virtually. They're super exciting because they're delivered by not just academics, but also practitioners and other um, uh, acad and other people who have started startups, et cetera. Then there's the tech and business coaching, which I've told you about. So we have a pool of, I think, 10 very specialized coaches right now, and you get assigned a coach once you are, once or if you are upgraded to the startup X track. We also have an expert network of high net worth individuals and you know, C level people and important organizations like Babylon Health and Google and et cetera, who you can reach out to because they're part of the expert network and you can email them for support show and tell sessions, we have community and networking events, and then for the people on the startup X track, we help you fundraise, which means that we help you work on your pitch, on your presentation, and we introduce you to venture capitalists. The important thing to say about Conception X is that we will do what is right for you. Not everybody should or is advised to like progress to startup extract. For many people, for the goals that you want to do, project X is probably sufficient if you want to get an idea about uh, entrepreneurship, if you want to do the training, if you want to get exposed, if you want to eat, meet our industry partners. And that's a win. If you join the startup extract and you're on the route and off to the races to build a startup and raise funding, that's also fine. But we don't push everybody to build a startup because not everybody should build a startup. The whole of Conception X is to have this, these nine months with a lot of interesting people to experiment and iterate whether this is the right track for you. Um, so what makes Conception X different from other programs? We, are, we take no equity, so if we help you for free, basically. Uh, and we don't... Um, we don't we don't take equity but also the program itself is a not-for-profit so every kind of payments and etc that we take all go towards making the program available to more students it's non-residential which means that it's online it runs alongside the phd we don't care what sector you're in uh, we our first remit is to do what's best for the student rather than for our partners or the venture capitalists and we do really strong venture fundraising support as well. I think the fact that we're compatible with the degree is really important because I think this has made the program accessible to people who wouldn't have tried entrepreneurship otherwise. Because it's one thing to tell someone, quit your PhD and try to join this crazy six month accelerator to build a company. And another one that says, you know, do this during your degree. A question that I'm frequently asked is whether this interferes with PhD completion dates. And I think so far with 165 PhD students, it hasn't happened. On the contrary, this has made people more resourceful and more practical terms. Even if you do conception X, this could be two chapters in your thesis at the end. It's like the impact part of what you've done. So yeah, no delays and everybody has finished their PhDs because you are joining a PhD for a reason. So. We've had people complete their thesis and do stellar vivas as well. Um, how to apply? Well, applications will open mid-November. There's an application form on the website, which asks you know, information about you and your research and you know, what you aim to get out of the program. You apply there, we do the selection, and the program will start in uh, end of February next year and we'll run till next November. So we're doing this early so that you can have a chance to think about it and ask us questions. 
You can be in the first, second, third year of your PhD, it doesn't matter. Um, you can also, you know, do say, tell us that you're only interested in project X and that's also fine. And we will just, you know, help you in whichever way we can. You can link, you can register your interest in the Zoom chat and uh, on our website, conceptionx.org. We have a demo day on the 3rd of November this year. So the demo day is the final year event where we pick the most you know, high performing teams to present what they're doing to an audience of investors and clients. You're all welcome uh, to do that as well. And I think you can register your interest on the website as well. Um, I think that's it in terms of my presentation. So I'm very happy to start, first of all, by addressing some of the questions that are now in the chat. And then if you have any more questions, please put them in the Q&A or get in touch with me um, at riam at conceptionx.org. Right, so let me start addressing this question. I have a question about how to find mentors and advisors. How do we get them on board uh, since we can't employ them? And what, and what would interest them in joining the startups? I think I've covered this, but let me iterate this very uh, carefully. So in Conception X, we have a network of experts, we have mentors, and we have people from our partners in Barclays and Deloitte and Amazon who will be dropping in. I cannot iterate how much deep tech startups are buzzing right now in economy and finance. 2021 has been called the year of deep tech. So everybody wants to get involved. And what you have are the skills that, uh, you know, 40, 50, 60 year old bankers will never be able to get because you're at the cutting edge of you know, new AI and quantum. So people want to get involved. And I've alluded to this already, but uh, you don't need to pay them. Uh, I think it's about building a relationship with someone, working with them for a period of time, usually in the safety of the Conception X environment, um, and seeing if you, know, you have compatibility, uh, if you, know, you work well together. And then if you want to keep them on board for longer, uh, you can start negotiating either by giving them, as I said, a board seat or a small amount of equity. And we at Conception X can give you advice about that. And that's also the role of your coaches to make sure that you have those negotiations properly. I think also in Conception X, given that, I mean, you're all very talented PhD students from different disciplines. It's not uncommon for people to find team members on the program and we can help you with that as well. And uh, just seeing a question in the Q&A from Sahan, how does one find the right mechanism um, uh, to divide equity in the initial stages? Um, there is no right or wrong answer. Every case is different. Um, it's, it matters how much people are putting into the program whether you're working full time on it, uh, whether you have an advisory or you know, working position, how much people have already done for the company. But I think, you know, given that this is more of a human thing than a science, the idea is to speak with advisors or mentors who are you know, dissociated from you know, the, the story and get advice on how to do it. And this is exactly what we do at Conception X. Um, I see uh, a question from Ruben, how we are funded. Conception X, given that we're not for profit and we don't take equity, we're mostly uh, philanthropically funded by institutions and organizations who see the benefit of the program. So initially we got, we got an award from Barclays, uh, which uh, allowed us to run for a few years and they wanted us to do a cross university program, which is what we've achieved. We had some funding from Deloitte as well. And I think for next year, um, UCL uh, has seen the benefit that Conception X has done for the university. And we're also getting a bit of the CDT training budgets uh, to help us go forward. Uh, given our remit um, and our mission in Conception X, it's very important that the funds that we take are aligned with the core missions, which are helping students start their own companies, work on things that have you know, a sustainable remit. I think if you look at our website, all of the companies in Conception X are, are working on um, almost like a tech for good space. So whether it's health or whether it's, um, uh, electric, oh, sorry, whether it's uh, energy, et cetera, there's a tech for good remit as well. 
So we're just really careful where our funding comes from as well. Um, I see a question. If a student already got their startup idea, which is not related to the PhD research, would that be welcome as well? I think we're a bit flexible with that, as long as you're not doing something entirely different. I mean, if you're using some of the skills in your PhD in your startup, that's fine. But if it's if you're like you know a, a quantum AI researcher and you want to build a lemonade stand business, that's just going to distract you from your PhD. So as long as there's some level of complementarity, it doesn't need to be 100%. Um, it's really important. Um, I'll give you an example. We have a, a company that's become quite famous on our cohort uh, now, the, the one currently running. They're called Oxia Palace. And they've been doing is discovering masterpieces under masterpieces on paintings much better than what currently exists because they're using AI to find out what um, artists and what colors and what trends were popular in the era and actually reconstructing images and of course selling them as NFTs, which some of you might know about. Sorry, just give me a second. Yeah, sorry, there's some construction work outside. I hope you can still hear me. Um, so, one of those PhD students is actually uh, working on a Mars research project, finding out if there's life on Mars. So not necessarily related to like the art sector, but obviously some of the technological trends that they're studying um, in the, on, the, on the Mars project are also relevant to the art world as well. Um, I see a question about programming available for PhDs or for MSCs. I think there, need, there needs to be at least one PhD student on the team that you're working on. Um, because I think what we've seen in the past, that MSCs have a lot of work on their existing thesis and they need to be, um, they have less time to do the commercialization. So it's really more optimized for PhD students. Um, so yeah, I think if you find a PhD student who will apply with you on the program, he can be part of Conception X, but not as a lone MSc student, unfortunately. Um, there is another thing that uh, you might need to be aware of, which is to check your individual PhD contracts. As PhD students, you're in a very enviable position because in most cases you own your own intellectual property which basically means that if you start a company based on your research and your supervisor is not super involved or another postdoc, it, does, it means that you could potentially have full ownership of your company without going through the university tech transfer office. Every case is different, but we can advise you on that in Conception X as well. Um, any further questions about entrepreneurship, uh, things people have learned, um, IP, questions about how supervisors can get involved. I think we'll just give it a couple of minutes, but I think I'm just going to type my email here so that if you have any questions, you can email us directly. But I really hope that a lot of you will apply. Um, there's nothing to lose. You don't need to be on track to build a startup. What is the acceptance rate? I think the acceptance rate, no, we've done a system where the acceptance on Project X is pretty high. So if you fulfill the already stringent criteria of Conception X, which are PhD students working on a deep technology or a, a deep research or an innovative research stream who has interest in entrepreneurship, you'll likely get in. But the upgrade to Startup X is uh, meritocratic because it's whether we identify if you have a prototype and if we can actually help you to go to fundraising. So I think uh, if you fulfill those criteria, acceptance to Project X is about 80% because it's focused on training and we want to teach everyone. But upgrades to Startup X um, is uh, at probably 20 or 30%. Have you ever worked with founders starting charities or nonprofits? I think as long as there is a deep tech remit in the product or service, we don't care whether it's a for-profit, charity or not-for-profit. 
We don't do really well with services. So you need to be building a product rather than consulting because uh, that's a very different kind of business, but the nature of the company doesn't matter what it is. Any further questions? Sharon, do you have any questions? Or uh, No, I found that incredibly interesting. Um, uh, I did have a question at the beginning, but it's, it slipped my mind now, so I'm afraid <laughs> that I will go over it again to come back to you with it. But um, yeah. this has been incredibly interesting. Uh, 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 a talk and thank you very much for your time. Thank you Sharon and thank you everyone and I really hope to see some of your names um, in the application and I hope that some of you come to our demo day as well. Um, yeah so I think I really advise you to um, to listen to the next talk as well because we do collaborate with um, another program called Sparrow which is like much more compact and it's training focused. So Conception X is the kind of longer one that's more specialized in deep tech as well. But some of you might be interested in the Sparrow as well. Um, right, so thank you very much. And please email me if you have any questions. And thank you, Sharon. And I hope everybody has a good day on this um, 